Hello, this is Trends. I am Bumi Obano. And as always, I have right beside me Moses Omogana, the online producer. Hey, Moses. What's up? So, what's trending? Um, a lot, as usual. And um, by the way, you're looking stunning. Oh, thank you. <laughs> right, to get that into your head. Well, a lot has been trending. Now, uh, for this week, it's Nigeria and um, Brazil, all the way from South America. Now, let's start with um, Nigeria. Of course, we all know it's going on for weeks. Hashtag bring back our girls. Um, lately, in this week, there's been a new twist. Now, first of all, we got you know sad reports on Monday that the father, uh, one of the uh, parents of the adopted girls, died due to high blood pressure. Now, uh, Mr. Um, Horner was said to have died um, due to high blood pressure, especially when he watched the video released by Shekau and he found that his, you know, two of his daughters that were abducted were not in the video. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's there's a whole lot of you know trauma to go you know, through there as a parent, you know, mm -hmm. and when you lose your child, you don't know if you know, she's alive or she's dead or what, she, what she's going through. So, yep, he died. And um, sec second was um, the reports coming from the NUT, Nigerian Union of, of Teachers, where they're going to go on, on a, 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 a nationwide strike, you know, in solidarity for the hashtag Bring Back Our Girls starting today. There's going to be, um, there was a rally rather today in Abuja, you know, to, you know, in solidarity for the hashtag Bring Back Our Girls till further notice. Okay. Now that's it for hashtag bring back our girls. Of course, the campaign is still ongoing. You know, there's still mobilization. There's still logistics on part of the federal government and you know foreign help to bring back these girls alive. Now, what, let's go to um, Brazil. Ooh. It's the World Cup hashtag World Cup, or some people will call it the World Cup crisis. Now, crisis due to two major issues: budgeting and loss of lives. Now, the very first budgeting. 11 billion US dollars is said to be the total budget, you know, to set that's up. That's a lot of money. That's, that's a heck of money, if you ask me. You know, 11 billion dollars is um, the total budget to set up, you know, a successful World Cup championship. But matters are rising where, you know, the whole, you know, Brazilians are worried that, you know, that's a whole lot of money to spend on the World Cup. We need this money to be pumped in rather to our various sectors you know, to education, to, to health care, right? exactly. And in fact, some Brazilians are saying, you know what, we really don't have to host this World Cup if only we can just keep this money. So well, that's it's a bit too late because most of the money must have gone in to a lot of investment regarding the World it's Cup. 74 it? days are there about to the World Cup. Trust me, a lot of things can happen in those days. True. Now, second loss of lives. Se reports say that seven people have died in the a, in, in a course of construction and field work. You know, so due to construction poor workers. construction or absence of construction kits, we do not know the exact details of why they're dying. In fact, one, of, one report said one fell about 26 meters, you know, from the stadium trying to fix, you know, the uh, sitting seats upstairs and he died. So, and worry uh, that these people don't even have life, you know, uh, assurance mm -hmm. and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So basically that's what's been causing a lot of controversy in Brazil and, you know, it's going to be a tough... Yes. World Cup football season. And <laughs> I wish them a around. successful one. <laughs> I usually only watch when a few teams are playing. Okay, so you can join the conversation by sharing your views with us via Twitter at TVC Trends. Comment on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash TVC Trends. And send your pictures and video comments to the trends at tvcnews.tv. Now... A Sudanese court has found Miriam Yahi Ibrahim, a pregnant Christian woman, guilty of apostasy and has sentenced her to death. She has also been found guilty of adultery and consummating her marriage with a Christian man. This offense will earn her a hundred lashings. Miriam was given a four-day grace period in which to renounce her faith, repent and be saved from death. That grace period has ended, and, but she refused to repent. Now she will have to face the wrath of the law. The outcry over this case has been enormous, with both local and international rights groups, governments, and the media condemning the sentence and calling for the immediate release of this woman. Today on the program, we ask, should an entity, should any entity really, whether a state, a religious institution, or a social group, dictate what an individual should or should not believe in? Let's have a look at this first, and we'll be right back. Protesters gathered outside a court in Sudan's capital, Khartoum, after a pregnant Christian woman was sentenced to death on charges of apostasy and for marrying a Christian man. 
Maryam Ibrahim denies the charges, claiming that although she was born to a Muslim father, he wasn't a part of her upbringing. Hence, she grew up with her Christian mother as a Christian. After the conviction, Maryam was given four days to repent and escape death. The fourth day passed. Still, Maryam maintained her stance that she was a Christian and would not revert to Islam. The 26-year-old, who is eight months pregnant, was later sentenced on expiration of the grace period. Her husband, Daniel Wani, has called on the international community for help, saying he will continue to appeal the judgment. I was considered innocent and the marriage revoked. The revoking of this marriage means that my son is no longer mine. So this innocence means nothing and I will appeal for myself and my wife. He, however, expresses his disappointment at the late response of the American embassy, despite approaching them months ago when she was first arrested. Daniel is an American citizen. Her lawyer recognizes the immense pressure Maria must be going through. Of course, from the day of the conviction to Thursday, there was great pressure. Pressure on Miriam, pressure on a defense team. There were calls saying that she must be returned. Threats that there were missionary groups saying that if she was not returned, you would pay the price. I mean direct threats. From our point of view, we are proud of our Islam and we are proud to be Muslims and we defend Christians, which is the utmost show of reconciliation between Islam and Christianity. We are in this till the end and nothing will stop us from representing her. Reactions to this sentence have been mixed. The court has no appearance of justice or respect for freedom of choice in one's beliefs, personally and individually. They were given ample time to prove their innocence. But I for one believe in upholding traditions and customs as Sudanese. If the death sentence is carried out, Maryam will be the first person executed for apostasy under the 1991 Penal Code. You know, I have a little cousin and I know how much of a handful he is. And he's about two, three. Imagine what the woman will be going through with a child that is just 20 months. And the one in her belly. Oh yes, the one in her belly. You know, you know, when when I, I was watching the report, I, I I want to focus on this word. The, you know, the court told her to renounce her faith and repent. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's funny, but it's really not funny. And I'm asking myself, repent of what, really? And well, know, because wh um, apostasy really is, you know, renouncing one's faith for another. Hmm. So I guess repent from that crime. Wow. So she's been found guilty for that crime, and that is what they want her to repent Maybe of. we should find out if apostasy is a crime in itself, first of all. Well, in Sudan, it is. <laughs> Joining us to discuss today's issue is Barrister Inkechi Onyenso. And via Skype, we have Mawa Motat. He's a political analyst with a special focus on Sudan and South Sudan. Well, it's good to have you on the show. It's yeah. great to be here. Thanks for coming. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'll start with you. What are your thoughts? You know, you, we watched the video just now that explained what is happening right now. What exactly are your thoughts on this? Um, I'm trying not to be biased and I'm trying to be objective in my thinking. And I just want to focus on what is the law that mm. should apply in mm. this particular circumstance. You know, Sudan has been a very, I was just discussing with you, it's a very dynamic country. They've gone in, gone through so many things. There was a time they were, they had three systems running concurrently. They had the civil, the common law system running. Mm -hmm. They had Sharia system running. They had the um, uh, uh, customary law system running. And these systems ran concurrently till, I think, 1983, when uh, Sudan became a purely Islamic state. And shortly after that, um, the personal Islam law was introduced in 1991. Mm. And subject to all this, the provisions of the personal Islam law is in line with the Sharia and the Quran. But also in 19, 1986, the government that was uh, in place in Sudan at the time um, ascended to the International Co um, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And also 
ascended to the optional um, protocols that came with that, which allows for parties to petition the International Committee where their rights you know, have been infringed upon. They are also party to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, which is referred to popularly as the OAU mm -hmm. Convention on Non-Discrimination. So it's, so it's a confusing, like yes, it's like... They are being pulled from a lot of areas and they have a lot of obligations that are supposed to be Thank you know, you. fulfilling. So it's like they are not, they, they give one impression to the outside committee, uh, the community, All and right. then they have another one for their own okay. citizens. Um, Marwan, you grew up in Sudan. Can you just give us a quick and brief, you know, idea of what it was like growing up pre-Islamic law and after it became more or less an Isla Islamic state? Oh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yes, I mean, we, we grew up in Sudan. We grew up in the north and in the early years, 60s, 70s and 80s, it was a very different society then. You know, the, the kind of Islam in Sudan is... Uh, is Sufi based. So that means that, that it's quite a relaxed form of Islam uh, where devotion uh, to God and, and, and prayer and singing uh, is really the center of the religion. Uh, but as time passed pass by, then fundamentalists entered Sudan in the early uh, fundamentalist Islam, uh, you know, the ideological Islam, entered Sudan in the late 70s. So by the early 80s, we could see this expanding and uh, in 1983, September 1983, uh, the president then, Jafar Mohamed Nimeri, uh, imposed the Islamic laws and society started to change them. Okay, so now with this sentence and with the entire case, what exactly are your thoughts regarding this? Uh, it's a complex situation. You know, uh, Sudan has always had difficulty applying uh, Sharia uh, very strictly. There have been a few cases of amputation, amputation in the 80s. Uh, late 80s, early 90s, but then the uh, they relax, they relax a little bit. So at the moment, the authorities are playing it down a bit. Uh, they're saying, you know, let the court, let the courts have the uh, go, but eventually there will be appeals, and this thing is going to be looked at by senior uh, structures, including the government, and maybe think it could be overturned. So that's one aspect of it. Okay. Uh, the other, the other aspect of it is, is obviously, Maria, uh, the lady concerned is uh, half Christian, and and from what we understand, she was secretly Christian, because the mother is an Ethiopian Coptic, and the father is a North Sudanese Muslim, okay, which so uh, who did not really uh, play attend a huge her childhood. Role. Uh, he disappeared, he was not an absent father from, from an early age. So she was closer to her mom, her mother, and uh, she is a self-professed Christian. So the, the question of apostasy should not really apply. Uh, it, it appears that this case was actually brought uh, upon the girl, upon the woman by her own brother. And of course, uh, uh, there was an outcry that the son of the father was Muslim, the brother is a Muslim. Okay. Uh, there was an understanding that she a process has been committed, but from her point of view, she's, she's always she has been committed a no crime. Okay, okay. All right. Let me ask you this, Amon, before you before you know you move on next. Article thirty eight, for example, of uh, Sudan's interim national constitution of two thousand and five, provides that every person shall have the right to the freedom of religious creed and worship. No person shall be coerced to adopt such faith that he or she does not believe in nor to practice rights or services to which he or she does not voluntarily consent. Now, does this ruling directly contradict their constitution? It does, and, and it doesn't. I mean, the problem, as was mentioned by the previous speaker, is that Sudan actually implements a number of parallel laws, or, or all of which could actually contradict each other from time to time. Yes. And therefore, there is a lot of room for intervention and uh, things are not as clear cut as, uh, as they are. Obviously, I would believe that people should be protected in their beliefs, but in this particular case, from a Muslim point of view, uh, if she had been a Muslim, then under Islamic law, you cannot be a Muslim and then convert to another religion. Okay. All right, while Maung was talking, I heard you say yes. There's something you might want to say to that as a lawyer. Well, I was trying to just buttress the fact that they are contradicting 
laws, mm. con tra contradicting tra treaties that are operating Islam at the moment. Mm. I was explaining to you that Islam has ascended to the African Charter. The African Charter in various sections, mm. section 8, section Islam 9. Islam or Sudan? Sudan, I Sudan, beg your pardon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sudan has ascended to the African Charter. The African Charter in sections 8, 9, 10, 11, and I think 14 constitutes the rights, various fundamental rights. But it ends with the saying that if it is in line with the domestic laws operating in the country. Ooh. So how can you in one voice say, I have a right to inherit property, but, but subject to the if it is subject, the so you know, it, 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 you know the fundamental, um, the, fundamental the, 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 the domestic Sudanese man can say, look, the, I'm not contravening any um, international treaty because it says if it's in line with my domestic laws and my domestic laws say this, this, this. Okay. Miriam herself is insisting that she has not committed any crime because apostasy in itself it's supposed to be you know when you renounce one religion, um, religion for, the, for other. the other but yes. she claims that she, she grew up as a Christian so she has always been a Christian because her father the Muslim in this equation didn't play any role in her upbringing since she was six so in that regard is apostasy, is apostasy a crime, a, crime, a yeah. criminal act should it be a criminal act especially in her case hmm. unfortunately the, penal, um, the Islamic law says, if your father is a Muslim, you are Muslim. It doesn't make provision that if he didn't raise you, then you're allowed to be a Christian. So as her father is a Muslim, that he wasn't involved in her upbringing, she remains a Muslim in, under the Islamic law. You know, but then we have to look at what is fundamental human rights in all. Mm. It said is the universal declaration of human rights. But how universal is it? Mm -hmm. How many people have access to it? How many people can actually petition it? It is so glossy, so pretty, but then does it really touch those that really need it? People on ground, the general yes. masses. Marwan, you know, okay. sorry, Marwan, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, could you repeat it? Because yeah, the line was a You know, um, Miriam, Mir 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 Miriam insists, you know, that um, she hasn't committed any crime of apostasy, in quote, you know, being raised by a Christian mother, an Orthodox mother, you know, and with the absence of a Muslim father in her life. So, but she also maintains that she hasn't done anything wrong, you know, regarding an apostasy. What are your thoughts on that? Bearing in mind uh, the tradition. I, I, I totally uh, confer with the legal, adv adv uh, you know, uh, expertise that was provided there. Mm. Uh, yes, definitely, if your father's Muslim under Sharia, you remain a Muslim. Uh, there's no question about it. The question here is the case of Maryam is that she has, she has been uh, a secret practicing Christian all her life. So it's a matter of, of conscience for her, really. It's not a matter of, of fact and reality. And she was given a chance to retract her statement in court. Uh, the judge asked her several times whether, whether she is a Muslim or Christian, and she insisted that she was a Christian. She was warned that that would have repercussions, and she still repeated her statement that she was a Christian. So she's, uh, clearly there, uh, expressing her conscience, uh, you know, in front of her own God, according to her faith. Mm. But is it usual to have the courts, you know, give such pardon, like, okay, we'll pardon you four days if you come back and say, you know, I would um, revert back to Islam or revert to Islam, you know, is, it, is that common? Are well, they that lenient? Let me put it that way. I wouldn't say it's lenient. The Islamic courts are different from the regular courts. Okay. They give room for things like that. In mm. the average court, if you're, you know, you're charged for mother, unfortunately, you don't say, I repent, and then you go home scot-free. You know, you go through the long process. But Islamic law, their courts give room for things like that. Mm. You know what? Um, the, one of the, um, the philosophers of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I think that's um, Jonathan Glover, he said, human rights are needed the most where they are absent the most. So right now, this is going on. I'm really glad it's going on, but unfortunately, I'm sure there are hundreds of women that have gone through, what am I saying hundreds? Probably thousands, that have gone through worse in Sudan and elsewhere, mm. but because they had no voice, they were not lucky enough to have a husband as an American. Nobody heard their story. 
So we need to sit down and address, because it's not just uh, Mariam that her rights have been violated in international law standards. The right of her child. Mm. The child is entitled to, you know, um, health. He's entitled to a standard of living according to the international education. rights of the child, 1989. He's entitled to education. He's the part of all that. And in some societies, even the child in the tummy is considered a child and okay. is entitled to these rights as well. So we have three aspects of fundamental human rights being breached here from the international society. But because Sudan is principally an Islamic state, even though it has ascended to some of these international treaties, you know, this is happening. Okay. And it will keep happening. Mm. Okay, so we still have Mao on online, Skype. So, but we also have Mohammed Badawi. He's with the African Center of Peace and Justice joining us via phone. Mohammed, thanks for joining us. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, that's good. Now, the lady in question, that is Miriam, you know, she's eight months pregnant and she has her 20-month-old son in prison with her. Reports have it that they are being held in harsh conditions. We can imagine how a prison would be, you know, no matter how good it might be designed. For a pregnant or, lady. Yes, for a pregnant that. lady. Yeah. Now, that in itself is a violation of the absolute prohibition of torture and other cruel inhumane or degrading treatment, isn't it? When we're talking about human rights in general. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on this? In fact that, uh, in fact that the trial violates even the Sudanese constitution of 2005. And as I said before that, just we can refer you to Article uh, 27 and 38, a bit of right, and it appears very clearly the practice of the court is violated uh, good right. In addition to that, uh, the trial it shows the political will of the of the ruling party more than to ensure the, the, the fair trial and accountability and the justice. Okay. Um your center, the African Center for Justice and Peace Study is really trying to get people to understand that, you know, Miriam should be helped, sensitize the public, cre um, create awareness on this matter. Can you just briefly tell us what exactly is being done at the moment regarding this case? Uh, actually, we need to send a really strong message for the international community, for the Sudanese government, for all the activists, and whom are uh, really uh, want to solidarize with, me, with Miriam. Uh, the case is not only Miriam. The case is the uh, we have to call for the uh, legal reform for the Sudanese laws, as to match with the international standards. The case now Miriam is facing uh, death penalty, but also indirectly uh, her child and and the coming child as well uh, being punished. By the, by, the, by, the, by, the, by this party.